I know, I know, it's been too long, but we are working very hard here and working on a lot of different things here at the National Pulse. It's Monday, May the 10th, the year of our Lord, 2021. Quick reminder for you all, a quick reminder for our special in-studio guest today, should I say guest host, Natalie Winters. There is still a wall around the U.S. Capitol. I think we forget this now because, you know, some outer fencing was taken down a couple of weeks ago. But there is still a wall around the U.S. Capitol building proper. And if anything, it's getting more permanent. And as every sort of day goes on, Natalie, I find myself becoming more and more of what I would once call, as a pejorative, what I would once call a boomer, right? In the sense that I find myself quoting George Orwell all the time and posting 1984 memes and talking about tyranny and genuinely contemplating the ramifications of civil war, which, you know, 10 years ago, I laughed at people 10 years older than me for doing. But I guess it's true, you know, some of the some of the tropes that I was raised with, certainly, that, that, that seemed cringy at the time. Even some Reagan quotes, freedom is, is, is only a generation away from extinction. You know, those things, as, as you get older, Natalie, I'll turn your mic up here so you can come in on this conversation. Uh, those things only ever become more true. They only ever become more stark. They only ever become more urgent. Um... I've, I've, I've yet to feel at any point in my life, you know, even, even pre to post Brexit, that all oh, things are going to get better now. You know, it's, all, it's always just become that one step closer to, uh, you know, oligarchical collectivism. And you, you think about our topic that we're going to discuss today. You know, would, I don't know whether, at what point in your life you became politically aware. What, what was it? Uh, probably 2016. 2016. Well, see, that's incredibly recent, and you probably <laughs> felt quite good about that year. Yeah. Um, and I bet in 2016 you didn't think we'd be sitting here in 2021 being faced with a walled-off capital, very different from a walled-off salad for the Faulty Towers fans out there, and, 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 and you know, almost total and complete elite capture as far as the Chinese Communist Party and its and its incursions into the Western world are concerned. Yeah, I don't think I really would have even known what the CCP stood for back in 2016, and now it's probably the most common word that, that I say. But no, <laughs> I, I, I think, frankly, same thing. I, I feel like a boomer more and more every day, but I really do think that we are the closest that we have ever been to the brink of Western civilization and I think that kind of the, the best example of that is the stories that we put up about elite capture, whether you're talking about, you know, high level cabinet officials, frankly, even the president or president, I'm quote, using quotes with my hands uh, in the current it's regime. It's called air quotes. Air quotes. I'm, I'm doing quotes <laughs> with my hands. I'm really showing, it's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I think that that's just the most telling. These people who at least, uh, you know, growing up in, in the States, all these leaders that we were told, you know, these are the paragon of what it means to be American. These are leaders who are supposed to be defending your interests. And now it seems that every other day there's enough content for us to put out a story about how they've sold us out, sold out our jobs, our factories, our workers, really just shows you where we are. You know, we just put up a story about how the the co-chair of the Facebook Oversight Board actually headlined an event at one of the top Chinese Communist Party uh, linked influence groups that are traced to the United Front. And it's like at the point in which the person who's, you know, deciding what you get to see on a day-to-day basis on you know, your Facebook, if you choose to still go on that platform, is fully compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it really makes you kind of question the reality that you see in the first place, I think. You big, you, you long simulation? Yeah, not to go too postmodern, <laughs> but uh, I, I do. There are some hardcore simulation <laughs> vibes going on. Well, and it's the, it, a lot of that. I, I I think you know I understand how a lot of that can can actually not be a joke to to some people because often what we see over and over again here in Washington D.C. is the, is the same names, the same organizations, the same institutions. I mean, you look at today, for instance. I think Pamela Carlin 
has now been announced as the person who's trying to stop the Arizona audit. I mean, 18 months ago, Pamela Carlin was the impeachment witness. Uh, 12 months ago, she was the Facebook Oversight Board member. And now she's the Arizona audit stopper. So there's big simulation vibes in the sense that the the you know the npc characters keep getting getting regurgitated here but they are they are the enemy they i mean it's like playing goldeneye on the n64 and and you're i mean you won't know what either of those things are <laughs> natalie but but you know you you'll, you'll you'll shoot the enemy and then you'll round the corner and the exact same enemy will be standing right in front of you yeah. not that i want to shoot anybody yeah no. <laughs> no but i mean even say the facebook oversight board just to bring it up because i just mentioned it the person who who conceived of that was Noah Feldman, who was also an impeachment witness. Right. Who also met with the Chinese Communist Party-linked think tank, the same one that all the journalists who are taking the trips from the China-United States Exchange Foundation would always visit. So it really is all interconnected, and it's hard to kind of not lose your mind uh, because you you feel like you're going crazy. I I, I think you pointed it out to me once, but there's a a gif of the old man from The Simpsons just screaming into the wind. Oh, yeah. And that... That's what I feel. Like. Old man, old man yells at cloud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right, Abe Simpson. Um, speaking of old men yelling at clouds, that's that's a, that's, a, that's the worst. Why did you set that up, Natty? That was the cruelest thing you could have done. Uh, he, like, you're lucky he has a great sense of humor. Frank Gaffney joins us on the line. Frank, Natalie was talking about herself, but I couldn't help myself to be fair. So I hope you'll forgive me for the, uh, for the, it's become a strange afternoon already here at the National Pulse uh, headquarters offices here on Capitol Hill. Uh, he's not an old man yelling at a cloud. Frank Gaffney is the vice chairman of the uh, Committee on Present Danger China. And Frank, you have been like us. Um, I think we can all say very, very, very concerned about the about elite capture from the Chinese Communist Party and indeed uh, the Biden appointments that we've seen so much so that and I thank you so much for doing this by the way so much so that you you, you picked up on some reporting or I, I think you were tracking at the same time some of the things that Natalie Winters was uh, about the new CIA director so Frank Gaffney welcome to the National Pulse and 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 talk to us about about what you guys are doing now. Well, first, let me say, as the only authentic boomer (laughs) on this conversation, I want to stand up for um, your rights to (laughs) pretend to be them. Even if you're attacking me, and it wasn't her send up, it was you jumping at the chance. I c- so I let the record, I let the record show I've, I've taken a sense. Um, <laughs> it's, good, it's good to be with you guys. And listen, I, to Natalie's great credit, I mean, she really has been bird dogging this story. And we simply picked up on the extraordinary implications of having the director of the Central Intelligence Agency be deeply compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. And she, in her reporting on his testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee for his confirmation hearing back at the, uh, as I recall, it was the end of February, he lied about those associations. And I wouldn't have known it, frankly, had she not pulled it together and had the national pulse not given her the platform that she has used so effectively with uh, with your help Uh, so really hats off to you guys and what we've done at the committee on the present danger china is simply make the obvious point that this is totally unacceptable first of all that the cia director was working closely with known influence operations of the Chinese Communist Party. And when we say influence operations, let's be clear. Those are efforts made by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, to subvert our country from within. As part of their larger program, they declared to be a people's war against our country. That goes back to May 19, sorry, 2019, Um, In the People's Daily, the official propaganda arm of uh, the Chinese Communist Party, they said they were waging a people's war against us. We know, going back to at least 1999, that it involves their doctrine of, of warfare, unrestricted 
warfare, meaning it's multifaceted, and one of the most insidious, right. and I would argue most lethal of those techniques of unrestricted warfare, is exactly the kind of thing that Bill Burns, the now director of the Central Intelligence Agency, was engaged in, collaborating with, legitimating, and otherwise enabling during his time as the president of the Carnegie Endowment. So our point at the Committee on the Present Danger of China is to President Biden, you must fire this man because not only did he have all of that in his record, he lied about the nature of those relationships, the duration of them, and in fact completely dissembled about the ongoing quality of uh, those influence operations at the Carnegie Endowment, all of which are firing offenses as far as I'm concerned. Natalie. Yeah, I think you really obviously hit the nail on the head, and, and thank you for your kind words for my reporting, and thank you for amplifying our work. But, you know, we talk a lot about the United Front here at the National Pulse. Of course, we always try to tie it to how they're attempting to influence, whether it's journalists, elected officials, even textbook commissions operating in the United States. But I think what what the Bill Burns case really tells and something that I've attempted to kind of hammer and understand more is how this is not just an offshoot or some branch of the Chinese Communist Party. These are billion dollar efforts being carried out by explicit branches of the Chinese military, right? They have explicit government branches, the, quote, political work department of the Central Military Commission, which is an offshoot of the former general political department, where you really see a fusion of the People's Liberation Army and their attempts to, you know, overtake the United States to challenge our economic hegemony. And you see this coming out of military-linked organizations, but the way that they do it is by subverting the United States from within. If you read the Chinese Communist Party's military documents, one one of their blueprints, I believe it was from 2017, one of the most heavily used quotes in that was from Sun Tzu, and it was to quote, subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. And that's exactly what you see going on at the CIA and what you see going on with Bill Burns, right? They don't need to actually implement someone, say, from the Chinese Communist Party to, to run the CIA to have it, you know, achieve the objectives that they want because they have a proxy in there. As I think one of, I think it was you who said on Warren this morning, you know, he's the Manchurian CIA director because Bill Burns is so compromised by the Chinese Communist Party because for, you know, nearly half a decade, he's been working with these united front groups. He's been sending scholars to Beijing to do work. He's been having those scholars contribute since 2014, at least seven people, right? for the China US Focus which is the China United States Exchange Foundation their journal that they operate here in the United States that pumps out you know clear and present danger propaganda uh, st- stories that are written and published alongside you know former Chinese Communist Party officials even former generals within the Chinese military so this is the guy who's now supposed to be running the CIA, which should be tackling the Chinese Communist Party. But instead, you only see, which is really you know part and parcel of the Biden administration now, the individual who's supposed to be running this group is fully compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. And when you're talking about how China wants to subvert the U.S. from the inside out, I really do think that it is inextricably linked with some of the other things that you see going on at the CIA now with regards to how they're pumping out these you know, woke propaganda videos. They care more about intersectionality and what your gender is as opposed to if you're qualified to take down and tackle the Chinese Communist Party. And believe me, in Beijing, uh, you know, at the uh, headquarters of the China United States Exchange Foundation, Foundation, which I believe they're uh, headquartered in Hong Kong, they are sitting, leaning back in their chairs, and they are laughing at us extremely loud because they don't even have to worry about what our CIA is doing anymore because they're too busy putting out videos pumping, you know, intersectional uh, women with anxiety and how great they are at, at stopping terrorists in the Chinese Communist Party in their tracks. It's absolutely disgusting, and thank you for amplifying our reporting on that. And and speaking of women with intersectional anxiety. Frank Gaffney, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I did it once, Frank. i got to do it every time. You're making this a hazardous experience for a man of my it's a, it's delicate a, it's temperament. A, it's a podcast. Let me, let me it's a say, podcast. We've we got we to we we keep it gotta lighter. Keep it lively. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, back at you, Natalie. Um, one of the things that you pointed out, which was very illuminating to us, and we cite it, we in fact cite almost your entire article in our letter to the president, 
But the relationship of Bill Burns to this fellow by the name of Zhang Yixin, who is a top CEO of one of the most insidious state-owned enterprises in the People's Republic, uh, CIDIC Group is uh, the parent company, and his operation is the CIDIC Capital Holdings. And he gave at least a million dollars to the Carnegie Endowment, which bought him, effectively, a seat on its board of trustees, a seat which I believe he holds to this day. That was something he was given, I believe, if the reporting is in my mind right, Natalie, in 2016. In other words, a year after he started at Carnegie, and quite a number of months, presumably, after what he would have meant when he told Marco Rubio to his face, shortly after I got there, I shut these influence operations down. And by the way, he called them influence operations. He said, I was worried about these influence operations. So we're not imputing to him some uh, lack of clarity about the problem. He acknowledged it, and then he bald-faced lied about it. And why this is so important is what what Crouch, uh, what uh, excuse me, Zhang did was he enabled, apparently, funding for the center that Carnegie established at Tsinghua University. And again, this is in your reporting. But Tsinghua University is deemed by one of the authoritative outputs on these questions, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, to be a very high-risk operation because it is essentially a PLA, People's Liberation Army University. And uh, our colleague, it was Sam Faddis, by the way, who came up with that Manchurian director, which uh, is uh, apt because he was a longtime CIA undercover operative. But Sam pointed out that that organization, the Tsinghua University, is doing defense research for the People's Liberation Army, which means they're working on weapon systems and capabilities designed to, what, kill Americans. They are actively facilitating, promoting the so-called military-civil fusion strategy, whereby you basically get the entirety of China's uh, corporate sector to work for uh, in a dual-use capacity for the military. And then, not least, and this is the point that I, I really tried to hammer on the war room with you this morning, Rahim, this is an outfit that has been found to have engaged in cyber attacks yep. against the United States. Now, I don't know whether they were involved in this pipeline business, the colonial pipeline, which is going to have incredibly negative consequences for our country. But if they haven't, it's not because they aren't thinking about it or aren't capable of doing it. Here's, here's an interesting factoid for you all and your audience. There are estimated to be 200 to 300 Chinese manufactured high voltage transformers in the United States electric grid these days. That would be about, I think, 10% of the total. Wow. And presumably, they're hardwired by the Chinese to, with the click of a mouse, go inactive or worse yet, self-destruct. And if that happens, what's gone down with the cyber attack against colonial pipeline infrastructure, the most important arguably in the eastern United States, will look like the proverbial day at the beach because it will be grid down and it won't come back up anytime soon. That's the kind of capability that operates at Tsinghua University alongside the Chinese owned and operated influence operation, I think, called the Carnegie Tsinghua Center. Yep. Yep. Look, this is scandalous. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, two things for you. For both of you, quite frankly, um, 
number one, I mean, you 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 paint the picture of you know really a a, a 007, you know this is this is the single most consequential storyline you could ever you could ever be witness to um because frank like you say you have the 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 hardwired capabilities here but but also you have that coupled with a a, a you know fecklessness uh, almost a lack of competency on 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 our side of, of of the world of how to not just deal with this but even just to root it out and we can get to that in terms of in terms of why it takes natalie winters you know, to get into this stuff rather than rather than all of the other different agencies that are supposed to be keeping America safe and that and that Americans for for all the ups including and downs, the CIA including, yeah, including the CIA um, <laughs> and, and 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 that's a good point not a peep have we heard from anybody anybody can that, I give you my my uh, understanding as to why or my personal opinion yeah, sure. because do you know who was a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace who's that Jen Psaki Oh <laughs> well, there you go. But, but but I mean, it goes beyond. It goes beyond the the public faces of the of the regime here, right? It goes right to. The, you've not seen a peep from any lower rank or file officers across any of these uh, 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 institutions. And you did see. You did see those interventions during a a, a, a trial. Now. Given what we know from the study that we published this weekend over at the National Pulse about the number of uh, Democrats who were recruited into agencies versus the number, I think we lost Frank Gaffney, I'll dull him back in in just a second, uh, versus the number of, um, you know, Democrats that are put in versus the number of Republicans that are put in between the subsequent, uh, or rather the respective presidencies for left or right. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we going into some we're going into some detail here and there's all sorts of percentages and, and and graphs and everything that you need to look at i'm not going to try and explain them to you all um right now go on the website that's what the website's for consider it your kind of show notes right so there's that whole element of it i'll try and dial frank gaffney back in i don't know how uh, how we got disconnected from him there well in the meantime if if- oh, i think we may have we may have suffered a uh, um telephone outage on his side maybe uh maybe an attack of some sort but but <laughs> the, the other thing i wanted to mention natalie here is is this i talked about the competency right look at the pipeline that went down this past weekend i don't know if you even saw anything about it but it's not just that it gets attacked by this ransomware attack they tell us and that it goes down that it can't withstand that attack this is core national security infrastructure with social implications, economic implications, security implications, the works. This is as, is as important as it gets. And not only can it not withstand the attack, but also it doesn't come back online, they're saying, for another four or five days. Now, there will be engineers in the audience and there will be uh, computer science boffs in the audience who are screaming at me right now going, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, that technology doesn't even exist to withstand those attacks and, and get the systems back up online. That's fine. It may not. But what I'm saying is the... The United States and the Western world has never faced an enemy up until this point, not even the Soviet Union at its peak, that could so targetedly, aggressively, and anonymously execute successful attacks on national security infrastructure. And that bodes some real, real thinking about. Because the defense industry and the think tank sets and, you know, all the people we've seen on television for the last 20, 30 years who sold us the Patriot Act and, and, and the sensors for the planes and, you know, we've got to focus on electromagnetic pulse. And you think this is a cheap industry, ladies and gentlemen? You know, the defense manufacturing for, I mean, trillions upon trillions of dollars lobbyists who are funneled millions upon millions of dollars every year to keep these questions at the forefront in the minds of the intelligence committee and the national security committee and the armed forces committee and all of these wheels turning you're paying for it by the way right this isn't this isn't you know it's raytheon isn't donating 50 billion dollars to the united states congress for its logistical and administrative functions Oh, they may be greasing the pockets of the, the congressmen, the senators, and the staffers, and, and whatnot. 
But at the end of the day, you're paying for the wheels of Washington to turn. And now they come back to you and say, hey, yeah, we have known about these threats for 30, 40 years at a minimum at this point. But not only did we allow the Chinese Communist Party into the grid and not even not only did we give, you know, preferred permanent preferred uh, nation trade status to the Chinese Communist Party and allow them into just about every single part and parcel of your life, not life on Capitol Hill, not life in Calorama, of your lives, ladies and gentlemen. Now they're saying we can't even defend against the things that we said you needed to allow us to do in the Patriot Act, to pay for over the course of decades... Natalie, this is why I feel like a boomer more and more now, because I've lived it now. You know, I looked at older people when I was your age, and that's it, there you go, I'm the, when I was your age, <laughs> I walked over broken glass in my bare foot just to get to kindergarten, all right? <laughs> but seriously. Did they have internet back then? It, no. <laughs> what are you laughing at? That's crazy. The, Let's have this conversation, since I can't reach Frank Gaffney. <laughs> yes. What do you mean that's crazy? Uh, I My first internet service provider was CompuServe. I don't even know what that is. Right. Since middle school, I've been forced to bring a laptop to school every single day. They wouldn't. Can you, can you believe this? They would not let us bring laptops to school when I was a kid. Good. <laughs> well, <laughs> come on. I wanted to play football manager. Um, but CompuServe. And what you would do is you would... Uh, a wire would go from your, and I guess a lot of the audience, most of the audience will will know this, right? But let's take a trip down memory lane for the sake of Natalie Winters here. You would connect your, your computer, your tower. You know a computer tower? No. Yes, you do. I mean, I can envision. Yeah, you know what, what it, it looks, looks like. What it looks like, but I don't. You've never had one? No. Right. So I must have had five, six computer towers growing up, right? So you have your tower which you'd buy for about 500 pounds at, you know, Tandy. Now this isn't just going back. This is going back and to England. <laughs> so travel through time and space with me here. Um, and you would connect your, with a wire to the phone line. Okay? Then you'd go on the computer and you'd load up America Online or CompuServe or whatever it was, and you'd press connect to internet. <laughs> why, are you, why are you laughing? Because it just sounds so bad. Nasty. <laughs> well, can I, you know. well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, it's better than what we've got now because now we're always online. Wait, wh- when, like, what year was this roughly? Oh, the 1940s. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I imagine, the mid 90s. Yeah, I remember about 1996. Because, so I, I go through archives of a lot of these chinese influence group websites and they start sometimes around the year like 2000 and some of the old templates that they've used they're so great that it's just like all comics (laughs) that was how we did it and it's like they have flashing icons it's just that's how we did it (laughs) so it always cracks me up so that's what i'm envisioning Okay, well, and you're right too. That's exactly what the internet Because I'm sure you were going like. on the uh, CCP influence. But the, the, but the, oh, the whole internet looked like that. It was, you know, little revolving GIFs, but really like pixelated of like exclamation points. And, you know, the coolest thing around back then was Word Art, which was on Microsoft Word. I know that. Yeah. Yes, I know that very well. And you'd have the, you know, the curved headline of yes. your essay. You know, yes, yes, I yes. still remember the name. You could of, do gradients. So. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that was that. Yeah, well, yeah, you're yeah. getting into a whole different ball game there. Gradients, poor. <laughs> God, I wish I had gradients growing up. Um, so you you would press connect to the internet and it would dial like like a, a speed dial, you know. So go boop 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 boop, and then it would reach the exchange on the other end and it would go bang bang, and then you'd be connected, and it would go welcome to AOL. At least that's what the AOL did. It was Joanna Lumley. It was an actress in the UK who did the AOL voice in in the UK. I know it was different over here. I forget. It was some famous actress did it here as well. Um, can you know this show, uh, the show, the movie You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks? No. And Meg Ryan? No. You've never seen this? I don't know anything about popular culture. So I wouldn't necessarily call You've Got Mail popular culture anymore. <laughs> but in the in the mid 90s, it was the rom-com. Sleep I wasn't this. alive in the 90s. Yeah, but I mean, I wasn't alive, you know, when Chuck Berry was tearing it up, but I still know Chuck Berry songs. I don't know who 
what is going on here? I just the first know we haven't done a podcast together in like two weeks, and it's all just descended into madness. <laughs> this is why nobody leaves comments going, "Where's Natalie anymore?" Because this is what they get. <laughs> Who's Chuck Berry? What's America Online? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, not sorry, as your generation would say. Uh, should we try Frank Gaffney again? <laughs> yeah, Let's I'd see love if we to, can reach him. To hear what the internet was like in his day. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see. At least now it's ringing again. Try and get him back. He may have run out of time. We didn't only have him for a short amount of time, but I don't think he would have just hung up. <laughs> just hit. it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you called me, you called, you insulted boomers. I don't think we're getting Frank back. Well, we'll try and get him back another time. Can I give my serious follow up? Yeah, well, to what we've you still got, we've still got plenty of time. Okay. Um, so yes is the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to come back to the internet. Okay. Right. Okay, boomer. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, no, no, no. You are, are so right. <laughs> what? <laughs> this what is- was that? <laughs> was like, are you trying to like... Make this, amends this for calling me a boomer. Feel like a podcast. Well, but this is what the podcasts are going to be like from now on. Because I tell you, I'm so at my wit's end with shouting about the CCP every day. By the way, I'll tell. I'll let the audience of the podcast in on a little secret here. <laughs> Don't worry, it's none of your secrets. Frank's calling. Frank Gaffney's calling Yay! back. All right, we can get back on track here. All right, Frank, we're, we're back and you're live. Frank, do we have you? Oh no, I don't know if we can get him on. I think he's gone. I don't know what's happening here. Oh, oh, hold on, Frank. I've got you. I've got you on my speakerphone now, but I need you to come through the the device, and it's not connecting you to the device. This is this is a disaster of epic proportions. I think I can fix it. Frank, do we have you now? I can hear you. Yes, Raheem. I did Yay. it. I've done it. I've done it. We've got you. We've got you, Frank. We got you back. Sorry, I don't know how we lost God. you before, but uh, <laughs> but we missed you terribly, and we ended up. Going... I think it's. I think it's the agency. Myself. Yeah, we'll go, we 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 went off on its on this terrible tangent about what the early internet looked like. So let's return to sanity here. Uh, bring us back down to earth, the, Frank. The, the last the last thing that I heard was that um, Natalie was talking about uh, somebody who was a non-resident fellow. Yes. And that dot needed to be connected and if she could say that I can pick up on it. Oh, hold on. I've got I've got some I've got a way for you to learn uh, who that was without saying who it was, which is the new oh. meme, right? Tell me who it was without telling me who it was. I can I'll circle back if there's more I can share with you. I, I'll circle back with you if there's more to convey. Um I'll have to just circle back with you. We can You're circle back. With, I'm me. happy to circle back with you. I can Ashley, are you kidding? No. She was a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace. Uh, mm. Obviously no longer holds that position, but there's actually a lot of people who, who work in the White House now. I was just scrolling LinkedIn as I was walking over here who hold various positions it, 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 within the actual White House and the Federal uh, Office Building. I think that's what it's called. Uh, who, the, the Executive Office that Building. That one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, who are alums, alumni rather, of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, whether, you know, on an intern level all the way to, you know, their comms advisors and former fellows. So it's kind of like, I think, the Center for American Progress and that they unload a lot of these people into the, whatever, you know, Democratic or Establishment Republican administration is in power uh, at, at a given time. So it's really concerning when you talk about these kind of institutional fixtures within the Washington, D.C. scene, like the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, like the Center for American Progress, which independently we've in do- documented how both of those have, have ties to the Chinese Communist Party United Front the China United States Exchange Foundation. Uh, but what's, I think, the most concerning part about this this Bill Burns story is how he lied about it to to sitting senators. And, and frankly, too, I mean, even with what, what he did say, which was that he, he, you know, quote, moved very quickly to to end these relationships that he inherited, uh, even though about two years into his tenure, they were still accepting money from these various groups. Um, I don't really think it's that difficult to stop accepting Chinese Communist Party money. Just stop doing it. The reason why it took so long was because these these institutions, these organizations, these people, I mean, frankly, I think ideologically, 
they're very malleable and all they care about is just money. All they want are the millions of dollars that, like Frank was saying, this guy who is the chair of the basically the highest ranking entity overseeing the United Front donated, poured in hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably, you know, that's at least what was reported, uh, into the foundation. So it, it really just, I think, kind of shows you what's, what's going on in D.C. here, which kind of brings back to what we were talking about in the beginning of the podcast, is just these people, it, it's totally elite capture. They've, they've sold out the country uh, because, frankly, I think even though the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has its own unique and, and inherent sizable endowment from, from the Carnegie Foundation, I think a lot of people know that you know, the Carnegie Endowment doesn't really not doesn't really do much, but it's just one of these globalist think tanks that, you know, put out pay for play papers on, on a host of subjects and they have fellows and they host events. But in in the Chinese communist party's mind, because they hold influence in the sense that they kind of fill, uh, presidential administrations with their fellows, they know that this is kind of ground zero for how you influence DC politics, right? You go to the think tanks. Obviously we've talked a lot about how they've retained a lot of these lobbying firms that you were talking about, Raheem, whether it's Huawei, whether it's ZTE, uh, whether it's, you know, count Chinese communist party linked councils to promote Chinese business interests and ch- Chinese trade or the national committee on us, China relations. Uh, you know, they, they all know how you get to the heart of DC and it's through the think tanks, it's through the lobbying firms, it's through the elected officials. So it really is kind of a very, very, very powerful understanding of how Washington DC works, the Chinese Communist Party holds that allows them to infiltrate and influence these institutions. And and we, as in the American establishment, are so incredibly naive that you have Jake Sullivan up there at the Belfer Center swapping, you know, cybersecurity tips with former generals from the People's Liberation Army. You have the the person who is now running the basically the anti China desk. She's I believe her name is Mira Rap Hooper or Mira Hart, one of those two. Uh, but she's tasked with, there's a lot of names, but, but she's tasked with overseeing uh, the U.S. designation of Huawei as a national security threat. And we have emails from her uh, where she says she's totally okay and she's fine with how Chinese Communist Party think tanks are, quote, influencing uh, groups in the United oh, yeah. States. So these are the people who, you know, when you see American entities get hacked by the Chinese Communist Party, when you see Microsoft entities who has a long litany of business ties, you know, in China get hacked by by the Chinese Communist Party, you know, no wonder why, because these people have given them the keys to the kingdom. They've allowed them to reverse engineer how all of our systems work. And I think it culminates when you see Joe Biden putting out an executive order uh, rescinding President Trump's EO that said that any foreign entities, principally those retaining links to the Chinese Communist Party, aren't allowed to be involved in our power grid. I mean, just on face value, revoking that EO makes no sense why you would want any foreign country, adversarial or not, to have power uh, over our power grid. So I really think the only point in which you can get to that kind of absurd understanding of American policy that we should allow foreign entities into our power grid is at the point in which you are just so compromised beyond belief and that for decades you've been sitting up at think tanks and university centers whose MO is to basically swap tips with the Chinese government uh, in exchange for funding, in exchange for free trips, in exchange for whatever well, it is they're giving you. Look, <clears throat> this goes back to the the beginning of the podcast, right? Because I I am fundamentally blah, <laughs> oh and no. that's it. That's all we have time for. Oh no! Um, I am fundamentally convinced that this is not incompetence. Now that this is that this is um, you know Emmanuel Goldstein's book from 1984 about oligarchical tyranny that this is the only way it could have gone given given how much the west opened up to to foreign actors who were hostile in the under the auspices of free markets you know under the auspices of 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 neoliberalism under the auspices of 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 fukuyama's you know, failed. We never talk about this. I don't think anybody ever really gives this due consideration. But those those elites, right? The uh, the Fukuyamas, the the third way guy over at the London School of Economics, where where Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, Anand Hussein. No, no, not that one. That's <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I love that. That's what you think. The London School of. <laughs> Do you think the LSE is some sort of visa fraud university? You must think that. Well, it probably is now. But I'll probably get arrested for that one day. Um. 
the the all these folks who in the late eighties, early nineties attempted to convince the world that the you know, what was it called, the Fukuyama book, right? It's the end, end of, of history. The end of history. Right. And neoliberalism, open markets, you know, free trade, all of these things were for them the narcissistic be all and end all. I mean, they really did think. It's not like Fukuyama I, I, was being disingenuous. He wasn't pretending that he believed that thing to, you know, get on the think tank. At least I don't think so. Get on the think tank circuit, the speech circuit, sell a, sell a ton of books. They really believed it. That that was their arrogance. That was that was boomer arrogance, quite frankly, right? And and no offense to to boomers because there are plenty of you who have been, as I said at the beginning of the show, absolutely right about the things you've identified over the past couple of decades. But there was this this strain of, of of elite boomers in the very same way that there is this new strain of 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 elite millennials who are perhaps the single least effective generation ever. Right. And I'm talking about my generation. You look at you look at the people, the men on the left of my generation. These are the, the you know, the, these guys can't grow a beard. You know, it's like a, it's like a little wiry thing that comes in under the chin. They don't know how to build anything. They don't know how to break anything. They don't know how to um they they don't take the trash out, right? Their wives do that. Or their wives' boyfriends do that when they come over. But I'm saying, I mean, obviously I'm caricaturing a lot here, but but that's that that emasculine man is Jake Sullivan, <laughs> is my point. And and these people See, I don't, Jake Sullivan, of course, will think of himself as just the the you know foremost geostrategic thinker in the world, right? Now he will think that. Jake Sullivan's the kind of guy that will that will saunter up to you. He'll, and he won't saunter actually. He'll sidle. He'll sidle up to you at a bar, Natalie. As a lady, he'll do this to you. Well, I don't, actually, he'll probably do it to me. Um, get arrested for that one as well. Um, <laughs> And he'll go, oh, well, you know, of course, uh, you know, Fukuyama and really, you know, put to bed uh, Sir Halford Mackinder's uh, World Island Theory. And, you know, he'll just sort of talk general geopolitical gibberish at you to impress you. But he doesn't actually know what he's thinking. He doesn't actually know what he's saying. And that's why Biden, by the way, is the perfect boss for those people. Um, Because you have somebody who genuinely doesn't know what's going on around him allowing a bunch of people who critically don't know what's going on around them and this comes back to your point natalie about the chinese laughing at us and and that is absolutely happening i mean there's not a day that i wake up right now and think oh we're on the front foot of this <laughs> you know we are so far on the back foot um that it that it may even be worth saying that all is lost you know what i mean just as a last as a last gasp mechanism to try and recruit some more people into this who will go, no, no, all is lost. I'll fight with you. Well, thank you. Where were you the last few years? You know, but now you think all is lost. Suddenly you want to fight. Okay, so let's fight. What is fighting? And this is the thing, right? I love what Frank's doing. I love uh, the, the Committee on the Present Danger China. But this is the other question I was going to ask him as kind of the ombudsman for the audience here. What is sending a letter to Biden going to do about his own CIA? I mean, he nominated the guy. So what are we hoping to achieve? And don't don't get me wrong. I'm appreciative that our work is being, and it's mostly your work. I just put the picture on it, right? But I'm putting some cool I, pictures lately. Oh, you did do that picture, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of the pictures. The edit, and the, the graphics. The Twitter design. cards. And yeah, I'm doing a lot of that nowadays. You should nowadays. use some of the word art. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm grateful that they use the work and they put it in this letter to the President of the United States. We feel great about that, that, that our work is being co- corroborated by, by august people such as Frank Gaffney, who is a serious player, right, and serious thinker. But what is sending a letter to Biden going to do? Am I answering as Frank? Um, I, I'd prefer you answer as you. <laughs> like, do you see an upside to that? Is it the start of a campaign? Yes, well, I, I think maybe the the answer to that question lies in what you just said, in the sense that these are people who are, you know, very I think establishment in their thinking, and that they, you know, read Fukuyama for fun. Do they understand it? Probably not. But I think that they're very much the the letter type of, of people that they would take this with some 
put it, they, they still believe in institutions, right? They still believe in the think tanks. We know how they're compromised and they don't, they don't mean anything. But I think coming from an entity like the Committee on, on the Present Danger China might mean a little bit more to them than it would someone like us because I sure. think that we have such an outlook on these institutions that they're just facades for whatever corporate interest is willing to pay or whatever foreign government is willing to pay. So I think that when you look at the people who signed this letter, you know, they have decades, frankly, probably collectively hundreds of years of experience that are that is worth so much at high levels of government that they that they know and frank not even necessarily partisan. So I I think that, you know, you you have to engage with it. And I think if you don't I think that that's pretty bad optics, but but I mean I do I do agree with you at the end of the day. I think that you know what does sending a letter mean to a you know administration that isn't even an administration? It's a regime because they still Come haven't on, even <laughs> you know showed us that they actually won the election fairly, and they're doing everything they can to discredit that. So I don't know. That's my best answer. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's better than nothing. Because I, I think it's easy to kind of just take the the black I'm, pill. Look, I, and, you I, know, I'm not trying to. I'm not criticizing um, yeah. Frank. I'm just. I'm just sort of trying to get to the bottom of what the what the theory is behind sending the letter now, rather than coalescing a a you know a working task force of members and staffers on Capitol Hill to deal with this threat. And and what it tells me, Natalie, is perhaps they couldn't coalesce that group of people on capitol hill to do that part of it first so maybe they have to have a public awareness campaign then the public has to get involved call their representatives and then frank gaffney can approach people on the hill and go now look you're, we know your representatives uh, you, you, the people you represent are worried about this so you have to do something about it because right now if i'm reading frank correctly there's not you know there's no rubio who doesn't really care that he was lied to in committee and and where is where is where are any of them? You know, Blunt and 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 Sass and all the Republican committee members who were there when what's his chops? Burns lies about his involvement with the Chinese Communist Party, looks him dead in the eye and lies. And it's that was mid March. It's now mid May. So we've gone two months. Remember, what, did I do my cut? Was that is that not two months? No, no. I I was just gonna say something. Say something. Well, I mean, I I I mean this in the uh, least biased way possible. But the only reason that we know he's lying is because of the reporting. Right. That we did. Right. And why does it fall to an outlet that's staffed uh, okay, by fine. You know, that whole Got that. thing? Congratulations. No, no, I don't. I'll buy you a matcha no, no, or whatever. No, no, I'm not taking week. credit for it. It's but the you Carnegie Endowment's fault. They put up the press release. <laughs> but you should. So. And But nevertheless, okay, that's real reporting and we appreciate you for that. But now let's get into some real analysis around this. Because look, you don't like opinionizing very much. You're getting better at it. But, but I know you don't like it and it's one of your strengths that you don't like it. Um, however... You just you just created you just answered kind of your own um, reluctance to do this by saying why did it take somebody else to find this information? Well, because of broad um, disconnect, incompetence, and capture, right? All all three of those things on different people and on Capitol Hill. So if it takes you to find out the information, it's also going to take you to act on the information. Yes. No, but you no, see what yeah. I'm saying? No, yeah. Because we, we're doing all this work and we're putting it in front of them and we're asking ourselves, why aren't they acting on it? Yes. But how is that any different from us three, four years ago going, why aren't they finding the info? And then we realized they weren't going to find the info, so we found the info and now we're going to give it to them. And then what are they going to do? The same thing they did before, nothing. So it's going to take a whole new tranche of people, you know, people in this audience, people out there, ordinary people who never thought they could bother to be involved, set up a 501c3 in Washington, D.C., or anywhere, quite frankly. You don't need to be in Washington, D.C. nowadays to get this work done. But I know we can't do it all. So what is stopping people out there now? Because they don't know how it works, because they fear retribution from the state, because um, the barriers for entry are, are... I wouldn't even say they're particularly high. 
but people think that, right? They think, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't found a think tank. Why not? Of course you can. Well, how do you think all the rest of them get founded? Some guy has an idea, says, hey, I'm a star at an LLC. And the LLC becomes a 501c3, and it's going to be called Citizens for, you know, Lamb Chops. <laughs> and suddenly you've got the biggest lamb chop lobbyist organization in town. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take different people. Well, too, I, I think basically h- how I approach the Biden regime and, and doing oppo on the various members of it is I really look to the model that the mainstream media and their kind of affiliates used in the Trump years in that they had, I mean, they effectively had lists of every person who worked in the Trump administration. Right. They would scrub their social media. They would go through, they would look through all of their old tweets, all their Facebook posts, everything, their Instagram, every person, you know, all the way back to their, you know, high school best friends. And we don't have an entity on our side that's doing that. Right. I try my best to to go through and look, you know, I'm on the White House LinkedIn page all the time looking at the new hires going through their old tweets. Right, and these at, are the, but these are the things they let you see. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? No, but I, I think more people need to get into that fight. And there's, you know, I don't have any magic secrets. It's all publicly, you know, when that New York Times reporter called you and said, what database do you <laughs> have? <laughs> see, I was going to bring you, that up. You know, what is the magic tool that you... No, we just use kind of the same fervor and, sh- and strength and just raw, I think, machinery that the left and, and the various media outlets have, the Media Matters type organization, the funding that they have behind it. And we apply that logic to our side. And there's nothing stopping you from you as in the the listener doing it. And I think that you're very right and that people need to get involved. And it's not just sharing the stories. Uh, it, it's, you know, how, however that looks in your life, I think you can you can take a, a, a bigger stance and fight harder for it because you have to or else we're not going to have a country. And I don't say that lightly. You know what? It's not it's even at the point now where it's not even that you won't have a country. It's you won't have a you won't have a culture. Right. You won't have a Western yeah. culture. I mean, you know. That. God awful documentary series exterminate all brutes. Have you seen this HBO? No. Let me let me try something else. You won't have seen this either. So don't worry, it's not your deficiency. <laughs> but it's 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 something even more to this point that I want to make. Have you heard of Knives Out? No. So Knives Out is a movie that came out I think 2019 and it's got uh Daniel Craig and Daniel Craig plays a kind of uh Alabamian Hercule Hercule Poirot. Do you know what any of that means? You know what Alabamian means? <laughs> yes. Um, he plays this investigative um, d- detective, right? And he's trying to figure out. If you, by the way, if you there, there are, I'm not going to really do any spoilers here, but if you haven't seen it, maybe maybe pause and watch it. Two times speed. <laughs> yeah. So the whole premise of this movie is effectively that this wealthy white author dies and his family are all fighting over his assets. The circumstances of his death are incredibly curious. There's a whole investigation that goes on around this. There's, you know, car chases and all this, you know, cool action stuff that's going on intrigue mystery the works right and it's and it's and it's a pretty well acclaimed movie it gets good reviews and people tell me they like it but the 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 crux of the story is that the dead author leaves in his will all of his money and assets to the hispanic maid who or or nurse rather who's parents were illegals and so she's got this big problem about how you know if the police find out that she was in any way involved in his death that they might deport her mother you know and most it's not sold as like an sjw movie it's not 
that narrative isn't in your face as, as in your face as I've just uh, described it. But that's how I saw it. And it's this, it's this, here are the whites, you know, fighting amongst themselves. And inside the white family is somebody who's considered alt-right and there's somebody who's considered an SJW. And so that's the left and right of American politics in that white family. And here is this just just deserving Hispanic nurse whose mother came here illegally, but so what? You know, and at one point, the alt-right boy in the family calls her an anchor baby and all this stuff. The end of the movie has the Hispanic nurse. I said there wasn't going to be spoilers. There isn't, it's not that much of a spoiler. It's not that great a movie. Um, standing on the balcony of this house, looking down at the white people looking up at her and they're thinking she owns this now this is her land and it's this is this is what i mean this is why how can you possibly have any grievance with tucker carlson for talking in the abstract about replacement theories that are being that are being peddled by the left. Like, that is a great replacement theory movie. (laughs) It is. It's a pro, like, replace the whites movie. But Tucker Carlson gets in trouble for talking about it. And so I don't think it's even just not, hey, you don't have a country. They're trying to erase a people with this. They're trying to get rid of an entire culture. They're trying to kill everything that, that, that European people made. I don't think there's any other way around that. I don't think there's a way that you can, you can gloss over that. And so, you know, I, I wrote the book Enoch Was Right in 2019. And one of the critical things that people get wrong about Enoch Powell is they think he was a, an ethno-nationalist. He wasn't an ethno-nationalist. Uh, he believed in interracial marriage as a means by which to integrate people. And, you know, he he outwardly rejected running under a national front ticket because in England, the national front at the time were an, an outwardly, I mean, they use the N-word and all that. They're an outwardly racist party. And he rejected them. But Enoch's point of, of, of Enoch was when I wrote Enoch was right, I found Enoch's point was not, you know, hey, um, you know, the darkie's going to be in charge, right? I'm parodying what the left say of him. Um, he used this phrase. He said, the, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. But it wasn't his phrase. It wasn't something he was saying. He was recalling what one of his constituents had told him as a means by which to show the level of um, discomfort that Brits had at the time with mass migration. And it's an incredibly nuanced point. I think somebody's falling down above us, Um, in case you can hear that, ladies and gentlemen. But you can't have these nuanced discussions anymore, these nuanced arguments anymore, because they are verboten. Me, me Me even quoting a quote of a quote, which is what I'm doing when I say that part of Enoch Powell's speech from 1968. That's banned now. So how can you possibly... And here's here's what I'm going to throw back at you as a question here, Natalie, because I suspect that very soon, very quickly, I mean, what all this, like, stop the AAPI hate is really about is shutting down criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. And is making is going to make in the in the very near future your work into a hate crime. Yeah, I I uh, see the writing on the walls on that one, and it already is kind of starting to, to percolate up. I'm inclined to think about the committee of 100, which conducts private briefings for basically every congressional leader. They have 
a lot of influence uh, over D.C. They host meetings with former congressmen, do the whole, you know, trip to China thing. Uh, and they've been hosting for several several years annual conferences, kind of with the, the angle being that any of the professors that get indicted by the Department of Justice for working under the Thousand Talents program and failing to disclose those ties, that is, again, uh, an explicitly Chinese government-backed program that seeks to decouple scientists from the West and use basically taxpayer dollars that fund those research also to boost China's development sector with regards to scientific research. Um, but they, they chalk that all up to racism. That's, that's the only reason right. why there was an op-ed. I, I believe it was a Newsweek, maybe two weeks ago, uh, an individual, the daughter of, of a scientist who was recently indicted for failing to disclose ties to the Chinese government while taking U S tax dollars for research. Uh, and basically she just lamented the whole piece about, how it was racism uh and i mean it's really such an odd angle of attack that's so hard to engage with because it's it's just so distanced from reality that i mean i I don't even really know how to engage with it (laughs) and that's the point too uh i mean obviously these are narratives that i've seen for months in chinese state-run media outlets but they're slowly starting to kind of permeate and, and percolate into Western media and just general. I've even started getting some, I'm sure they're just coming from, you know, Wu Mao accounts, but some people saying, oh, well, the reason that you do this is because you just hate Chinese people. And, <laughs> I, and I think what's, what's, what's really an interesting angle to all this that no one talks about, and perhaps the best way we, we combat this forthcoming narrative is by playing this up. But, you know, I'm, Steve obviously says it every day that, you know, the greatest victims of the Chinese Communist Party are the Chinese people, but something that I think people don't understand because it's not reported on because the media refuses to talk about the United Front because, you know, they're too busy taking trips from their various subsidiaries. Might I add that the United Front has an explicit branch that's made to control and kind of subdue any any outcry, any calls for help that are coming out of Xinjiang uh, as the media is lecturing us on how, you know, while we do as aid and abet uh, oppression. Uh, but, but these media outlets... And, and the journalists who, who are writing for them, I've just lost my train of thought, but my, my point being that the, the United Front, their, their explicit goal is to control overseas Chinese communities. Right. They seek to infiltrate the various Chinatowns, the various Tongs and Triads. These are the fraternal organizations that, that really kind of co- compose Chinese culture in the United States in the West. So if you want to talk about the number one victim of these Chinese influence operations, which is what we talk about, these are the people who are attempting to intimidate and silence and scare the Chinese people who, who moved to the West because they understand that communism doesn't work and that the Chinese Communist Party uh, is, is evil to its core. We'll be going a long time. Over an hour, which is why you're losing your train of thought, which is why I'm losing mine as well. <laughs> I'm hungry. Uh, I'm hungry for scoops, more scoops. I just uh, put one up. All right, we'll do more on the nationalpulse.com, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you want to support our work. Whether it's the hilarity, I'm sure you've laughed over the last hour, I'm sure you've cried. Um, fundrealnews.com is where you can do it. And I want to say a big thank you to all of those who have been chipping in in recent weeks to help our work oh i said earlier on that i was going to share something with the audience and then frank called back in so i didn't do it that thing is that we are going to do a redesign of the site to make it crisper cleaner simpler an all-round easier experience for you to share we'll hopefully have that up in a couple of weeks if you want to help us get there and help this audience grow head over to fundrealnews.com I want to read out some of the names of the people who have joined us in recent days. John, Julie, Grace, Edward, Rich, Paula, Jeff, Ralph, Margaret, Stephen, Michael, Darren, Leonard, Richard, Michael, Margaret, again, John, Catherine, Richard, again, Amanda. These are all different people, by the way. There's more than one Richard. Joan, Janet, Mac, John, Svetlana, Heather, Brandy, Peter, Mary, Marie, Megan, Thomas, Christopher, Martin, Beth, Bill, Piers, Mary, Eric, with a K, Betty, Stephen, Glocker, Patricia, Maya, Kevin, Monique, Michael, Angela, Amy, Dimmy, Maria, Samuel, Kim, John, Patricia, Jane, Donna, Sherry, Tiffany, Janet, thank you all so much for your support at fundrealnews.com. We'll see you again later on this week.